All right. Um, as you may or may not know, I teach a course at the Fletcher School uh, called Foreign Policy Leadership. And actually, a few of my students are in the room, or past students, Elena being one, and Yvonne being a very difficult student, isn't here. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> he fled. So, <laughs> he fled. So, I have some experience in teaching about leadership. Uh, when uh, Jack and Majay uh, asked me to host this session, uh, they asked me what I thought about leadership, and then they talked a little bit about how uh, they see leadership and how leadership might be different in a nonviolent conflict struggle than it might be uh, for someone who is leading a country in foreign policy. So the first thing they said to me was that I should read Peter Ackerman's dissertation. Well, let me tell you <laughs> that yesterday my staff went down and got the dissertation. So this is what Peter Ackerman wrote as really background at his PhD at the Fletcher School as background really to, to what has become, see he is afraid of me. Um, <laughs> to what has become this wonderful institution. As I went through it though, you'll see, I have to admit I didn't go through it. My it's staff went space. through it and there are these little, little uh, uh, tabs. tickers, tabs, where he talks about leadership. So you can see that leadership is not a major theme of this dissertation. And yet here I am believing that leadership is extremely important. And we have just witnessed an extraordinary leader. Um, we not only saw the movie, but he spoke to us. And I think with the movie and with what he had to say, we can see a lot of the qualities that um, successful leaders have. So let's keep that in the background. And then I'm going to interview um, to other successful leaders and we'll see what they have to think to say about leadership. I should say that when I teach leadership, I call it a conversation with leaders about leaders. I don't think there's a science of leadership. Uh, leaders come in all shapes and sizes and forms and personalities, place counts, culture counts, moment counts, Everything really comes together, I would argue, and make leadership a rather magical thing. Good leadership. And if we get through this in the, this session and the amount of time we have left, I'll end up by asking some questions about bad leadership. And I call that tyranny. And I do think that any leader of a nonviolent movement struggle is going to have to not only understand leadership, but is going to have to understand tyranny. So, um, when I teach about, or when I have conversations about leadership, I bundle it into three categories. One is what I call the quality of a leader's mind. The second is the quality of the personality traits. And the third is the quality of the heart. And under that I put such things as character, goals, principles, ethics. So that gives you an idea of where I'm going to be heading. And I think there are three issues that Jack and Majay brought up where um, leadership in the context that you're dealing may be different from foreign policy leadership, may, may not be. The first is collective leadership versus singular leadership. And President Nasheed today said it wasn't singular, it wasn't me, it was all the people behind me. He also said it wasn't just Martin Luther King, it was obviously James Lawson and others as well. So that's one theme we might pursue. Another one is leadership before power, by which I mean taking power in a country, um, and leadership after that. Do they, are they the same skills? Are they different skills? And then thirdly, and this ties into it, uh, the use and abuse of power. And I think that goes to ego. So we need our leaders to have strong enough egos in order to accomplish things 
and to want to go forward, and yet at the same time, we don't want them to have such strong egos that it becomes about them. So, with that as background, let me ask a question or two. And the first is, are you willing to share with us the first moment when you realized um, you were probably going to be a leader or that you wanted to be a leader? Because I have a feeling that everybody in this room has this burning inside them. Um, so, in the organization that I came from Canada to the U.S. to work for, Students for Free Tibet, which is an international Tibetan diaspora rights um, activist group, uh, I came because I desperately wanted to work to, to do this job that was put in, uh, in front of me, which was to work full time for the struggle for Tibetan rights and freedom. I didn't think that much about it. It just seemed like a natural thing. It just happened. Um, but when I, sorry, but when I, um, when I, so I worked uh, under the executive, the wonderful leadership of um, John Hosevar, who's now uh, head of oceans at Greenpeace in the US. And when he stepped down after three years and it was time to get a new executive director, I was busily trying to figure out with the people around me who I could possibly get along with as well as I got along with John mm -hmm. because he was such a wonderful, hands-off, supportive leader who was letting my Tibetan colleague and I kind of mm -hmm. run ahead and do things as we felt they should be done for our people and for our movement. And it was in that process that a couple of people that I really respected and admired said, you know, you should do this. And I spent so much time arguing with them that there's no way I could do this because I couldn't get up early enough and get to the office at 30 like John, that, you know, I was a night hawk, not a morning kind of disciplinarian type leader as, as um, he was in a quiet way. And, and it was in that process that the more I wanted to do, the more I felt like as I went through a process that was really well laid out by our board of directors and by our peers and our community, the more I, I put myself out there for the job, the more I realized I could do it. But I don't know. The more I wanted you to do it. You basically found with the nice <laughs> <laughs> And you? I think I'm old enough to say that I'm a typical medium level leader. <laughs> so, uh, when I was underground, I knew that uh, the underground management of solidarity is just a symbolic, patriotic step. The only day role of my colleagues, I knew I had hidden meetings with them, was not to be kept by political police. So my role was to manage, to be entrepreneur of the underground, to do things. And I think that I'm both being an architect and without finishing my movie school, I like to do things to the end. It means not to do by myself, but to organize the team and to see things done. And in this very general division between visioneers, doers, and talkers, I'm a doer. So, visionaries, Talkers and doers? Yeah, I think I'm a doer. I like to do something, to design a project, to execute the project, to, to assemble a team who is ready to do this project. I don't need, perhaps because I have a profession in which authors write, Author rights, author's rights are something uh, you know, traumatizing, whether this guy is a real author of the project or this one. <laughs> so I prefer not to touch upon this issue, but to organize a team in which everybody feels that he's in. Uh, in, in Poland, which is a country of individuals, it's a hard issue to keep the team spirit and to design something from the beginning to the end. We are not a very punctual nation. That's why we won. Because my, my approach to Poles is that Poles emotionally understand the time only till six weeks. So when there's a defeat, they don't remember that this is defeat. They say, this spring, it didn't happen. We didn't finish with communists. 
but perhaps during summer, during <laughs> summer, and without this notion of time, it's much easier to win. So ironic, we win because we have no. Because you can't tell time. time. <laughs> okay, but no rush. second question was different, but about leaders in different times, before, after, and so Well, on. I'm but not there yet. Uh, can yeah, you? Yeah, can yeah, we okay. hold off on that one? Because yeah. I'd like to I pull start. out. This okay. this point you made. And I you are the leader. You I am. Leader. I am the leader here. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you also mentioned this right away. You said there was somebody who encouraged you to be a leader, um, and you're saying that you like team. So obviously they were pulling you in to play a certain role in the team. Could you say something about how you um, motivate a team or how a team learns to motivate itself? And exactly what does it mean to lead inside a team? What kind of special skills does it take? You must have them. Do you see them? Now you've seen three leaders today. We've only seen these two leaders for a short period of time. But what kind of skills do you think a leader needs in order to work within a team and to inspire others, and also to be inspired, I would say. Um, it depends in which country. Okay. <laughs> but, um, what about your country? I, I beg to differ on this uh, opinion on that, because regardless of country, your question, I think, was targeted at within the team, leadership within the team. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would put uh, fundamentally kind-heartedness, friendliness with team members, is the key to leadership. Um, if you huh. um, tend to enforce um, your command as leadership, it doesn't work, um, then there's a, a small mutiny behind your back. So um, I think that's the key. Kindness and kindness and friendliness. And don't you think uh, that with President Nasheed, we could tell that he liked people? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that this made it very easy to like him. He's very likable. So you want to spend time with him, you'd like to work with him, and you would probably trust that you could work with him and not have something bad happen in your life, right? Yeah? Um, a leader, a good leader to work in a team needs to not want to be a leader. Um, I think that wanting leadership for the sake of leadership is one of the first and easiest ways to lose people's confidence. It's also one of the easiest ways to forget that leadership is about accountability, not being out do you agree, Lon? Yes and no, because I feel the same way, especially in our world, but I like to vet in context, but I watch all the time in our movement when in our community groups where there's just total there there are so many power seekers, I think especially because we have so little power in our people in the mm -hmm. exile world. So we have such mm -hmm. crazy sort of obvious power seekers to me really who want that, who need that job or that title or that chair at the front, and they, they get it and people help them get there and I don't know exactly what it is, but it's quite common, I feel like in a really, but then oftentimes that's not effective leadership. I don't see these people in our community or these groups doing, being really effective doers and I feel like in our circle, one of my colleagues is here, Freya, um, in our circles we have such a team atmosphere we do are we're just we're friends and even when new people come in and the young students come in and work with us in Tibetans in India and all over the world we're friends we have a lot of fun together but we do need the leader like uh, sometimes I don't want to do it <laughs> to be quite honest at all and then I feel like I have to do it sometimes I want to do it because I can see a moment where I feel like I could help and it's just about stepping up and stepping back so was there a moment when you were young, I'm going to go back, when you realized that you had the ability to lead, oh, yeah. that people would follow you? It's in every report card from my elementary school saying I was, I had the ability to lead and I should be careful in what direction I lead people. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you, you took my final comment, which is like a pow, uh, leadership, if you have these skills, it's a sacred trust mm -hmm. and, and you cannot abuse them. But I do think that people who um, end up as leaders, and we're going to use the plural here, usually have a desire to lead for one reason or another. And, and you know, you've talked about two different motivations. One is because you want to help, and another is because you really want to be the leader. And that's what's tough. So what do you do when there's someone in your team 
who you think wants to be the leader. How, do you use nonviolent conflict against that person? That's, a, that's an open question. So I answer, I didn't kill any member of my team. <laughs> okay, so I didn't use direct violence. Uh, I was using only direct passion. And I can say that uh, when we were, when I was really leading my underground firm, I had a principle I took from, I think, Edward T. Hall, uh, from his core piece, core piece uh, research. So I was treating rats as Turks were, treated, were treating Korean, the, the, the North Koreans in the Korean War. So I told myself, democracy will start in jail. Now that's, uh, that's constitutional monarchy, and now I am a leader, and if I will be arrested, that's my successor. After this successor, there's another successor. So it was a, a constitutional monarchy, because I am rather careful student of Raymond Maron, who said um. that Aesthetically, enlightened absolutism is much nicer than democracy. But it was constitutional monarchy. But uh, that's just, you know, in a humoristic way, a description of what happened in an organization which uh, had to be hierarchical in a certain sense of the word because of the environment. But when we, when we go to the time after transition in Poland, after 89, my conclusion is that Pol Poland is ruled by people who don't like to rule and to govern. Because to rule something, really, to direct a team, to manage a team, it's an extremely hard work. It's not a speech, not a, a philosophical essay, not a debate. But just to see things done without killings, which is hard. <laughs> so the question is, the question is, how motivate people, how convince them, how resign when we feel that we are not competent. So for me, leading power is understanding of incompetence of our competence. So I say I'm competent because I know when I, my competence is limited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For instance, I was never ever in my life an editor, a redactor, but I found a publishing house which published 120 books of Isaiah Berlin, Raymond Aron, Brzezinski, Menachem Begin, uh, you know, Nabokov and others. So I had, not to terrorize, but to convince my redaction what we can to do and what it means. I was only founder as a leader of my program, Sovietology Applied, Sovietology Applique. So I didn't want to do only to print literature or to do only Solidarity Weekly, but to, to make a real political center, political firm which will, be, will organize the society against the oppression. So okay. it was such a work. So I let's have done let, this work. Let's hold that thought. Yes. And Mary, you wanted to say something. Yes. Um, DJ's over there hiding. But she just said something very profound that I'd like to follow up on. Nonviolent civil resistance decreases dependency on leaders. Now, people look at this field and they see Gandhi and King, mm -hmm. but Gandhi and King are exceptions. They are far from the rule. They both had to be dragooned into leadership. When Gandhi arrived in London to study for the law, he was almost pathologically shy. He could hardly speak up at the meetings of the vegetarian societies. We know this from his own writings. By the time he got the courage to make a point, the topic had changed. Mm -hmm. Naturally. <laughs> it was when he arrived in India and saw his fellow Indians suffering as indentured servants that he was able to catapult out of that state of pathological shyness. And he became the leader that he became because the Indians looked to him for leadership. Martin Luther King had absolutely to be 
pulled into leadership. Uh, Jim talked about the fact that in Montgomery, the leadership began in the Women's Political Council and with the women. And then there came a time when all of the black pastors in the city were gathered together. Martin Luther King had to be pulled into leadership. Mr. E.D. Nixon, with the Brotherhood of Railroad Porters and the NAACP, was up in the balcony watching. And finally, he leaned over. I heard him tell that he, I learned this from him. Is you mice or is you men? He only had education of the third grade. Mm -hmm about age nine. And Martin Luther King was literally thrust into leadership. Now this is very, very typical and indicative of nonviolent civil resistance. Ramsey and Daoud know that in the 1987 Intifada, it was often young children, not the elders, young children because they were suddenly looked to, because they had been daring, they had risked their lives. And suddenly, even though their families had no standing, they were not necessarily from notable families, they became leaders. It was thrust upon them. This is the way it more usually works in nonviolent civil resistance. It's a very, very deep tendency as you read it. And I, I thank you so much, DJ, for saying what you said, because it goes right to the heart of what we're studying. And it's really what you said about how you emerged in the role that you're in right now is that people asked you to do it, right? They asked you to become, to take on a special role. Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't think it's, yes. But at the same, I mean, at the same time, I am, I do have certain qualities that have always sort of been there, but I think it becomes the balance of like, and I'm watching this all the time because what we're doing is trying to multiply. So we have the, the His Holiness the Dalai Lama as this, ultimate leader and it's been struggle that everybody looks to and everybody sees one person on you know constantly he of course is put on this level of Martin Luther King and Gandhi and he's living now at, in our time and somehow we have this incredible lack of leadership we suffer from the most painful middle level lack of leadership and it's been struggle that's one of the biggest things we struggle with and so we're trying to empower, train, bring up young leaders in the Tibetan community all over the world. We're trying to stop looking for someone outside to save us and start looking you know, mm -hmm. to ourselves. And a lot of the young people that we work with, I mean, they're also people who, uh, like I can see bits of myself in them. They're, they are interested. They are um, naturally kind of taking leadership roles in their community. They have certain qualities. And then it just becomes um, about training them and mentoring them and supporting them and guiding them and providing leadership, um, not just me, a handful of us, in a way that is needed at times and then stepping back and letting them do things. And sometimes it's not easy to know when to do that. But there are certain characteristics of leadership that are there. Sometimes people are more quiet you can help bring them up. Mm -hmm. But they have conviction or like ideas or beliefs that are so strong and then a willingness to push them forward, maybe not at a national or international level at first, but in their own groups, in their own communities, you'll notice that certain things are quite common often. So I don't know what how that fits with King and Yeah, well it's these are unknowable and uh, unknowable uh, questions or themes and uh, I think each one of us has to figure it out for ourselves and the role we're going to play. Uh, but we go back to these incredible people who are asked to take on the role. You take a King, you take a Gandhi, you take uh, President Nasheed. Um, they do play such an important role in terms of their charisma because they do reach out and people follow them and they have certain qualities. There are others who are just as important, I think is what you're saying, who also play other kinds of roles. And Most leadership business. needs to go down, wouldn't you say, or it's spread out throughout the entire team and also throughout the society. Is that what you're saying? Can you just clarify? Most movements of civil resistance do not have charismatic leaders. Okay. Dependency on leaders diminishes in nonviolent civil resistance. Most nonviolent movements have many leaders. Many, there's a proliferation of leadership. Right. Uh, often we do not know their names at all. Yeah, and that's 
what I meant by the leadership has to be spread out across sort of the, the team that you can say that they're leading in one sense and then all the way down through society. I mean, the, the, and isn't that what is exactly what we're trying to go, trying to do here? So I talked about the quality of a, of a mind, the quality of the personality, and the quality of the heart. Now I'm talking about everybody now. I'm not talking just about King and Gandhi and Nasheed. But let's talk a little bit about the kind of mind a leader needs. I took some quotes out of Peter's book. And he talks about the necessity of understanding, you know, the movement, knowing what's happening amongst sort of your own people, but also understanding really well what's happening in the group you are trying to bring down or the, the people you're trying to change. So what kind of a mind does a successful leader need um, in order, yeah, in order to be successful? I, one, I use the term kaleidoscopic and strategic. It needs to be a mind that can see sort of the whole picture, can understand people, can understand power, can understand events. Does that make any sense? Either one of you? To be frank, the discussion is for me a bit too angelic. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's take a case of Le Vauesa. I knew him not from the beginning. Uh, I knew him much better. I was his advisor twice. He didn't listen because his <laughs> ego was so big that he could be only person in this auditorium and he would speak to himself. <laughs> I remember very well when we, so much for charisma. when we wanted to satisfy him when he completely felt as a president of the country and uh, we decided in self, the Polish center right, civilized center right, that he has to be elected as president of Central Europe center right. We brought him to Hungary and he made a speech on the front of Fidesz party who was a winning winning, strong, young party. He gave a speech which started from a simple phrase. There is a legend on the front of us. And he finished by such a way. After it was a blah blah, but he had always very good interpreters. Uh, and after, he finished on one phrase. I give you an advice of an experienced freedom fighter. Unite in the beginning and dissolve. <laughs> they, it was full silence in the auditorium. They couldn't get the point. And they so still haven't, have they? Why I am returning to Valenza case? Because he, his ego was tremendous. We knew it. Upper ground, underground, from the beginning. From the beginning that when he's taking a microphone, he wouldn't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, we needed this leader. We were very satisfied when he got Nobel Prize for peace, because he didn't kill anybody, and he was for nonviolent movement. <laughs> and he directed effectively this movement. He was not a good ruler. He didn't know how to manage the movement after, but for the very transition period, for the momentum, he was wonderful. No one intellectual could direct this trade union of Poles deprived from their own state, because it wasn't a regular trade union of workers. We were citizens deprived from our own state. And he, his bad features <coughs> were his pluses. He was using po Polish language in the way, very creative, not grammatic at all. But he was very inspiring in what he was saying. And to, to give him a tribute, I can repeat you to his statements when he was asked on the TV whether Poland has to join the European Union. His answer was evasive, of course. We have no emergency exit. When he was asked whether Turkey has to join the European Union, 
I was listening on the radio in the car. I was I, I was close to make a crash. <laughs> he made a stop, full stop. I think that after 10 years, he made a long, long stop. It will be evident that the God is only one. <laughs> <laughs> no one Polish member of intelligentsia could play with the with the facts, with the emotions in such a way. So someone can be that guy, but for a certain momentum can be the best leader of the non-violent movement, being a bad guy, personally, <laughs> you know, emotionally, because he was so egotic. Nevertheless, he won, and we won with him. You know, you brought up the power of words, and um, you obviously have created an extraordinarily important symbol. Um, can we talk a little bit about uh, the power of words and language? Now, she talked about this as well, didn't he? He said we have to sort of, did he say recreate language or to create language? To liberate language. Yes. She said language was under arrest and the regime owned the words and the meaning to those words. We must come up with words and um, words with the meaning and the concepts. So what do you think of that? You obviously speak very well. I've watched you on YouTube over the past few days. I've watched you try to interview somebody, try to get someone to use words. Um, and they refused to interview you, so I uh, thank you for letting me interview you. But what about the power of words and symbols? Mm, let me make a very short point. I think when we are in the movement, which is in the opposition, sometimes words are deeds. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can play with words, we can write or speak, and it makes a certain realm. But during the transition and after the victory, the spirit is over. We have to produce accomplished facts when we can. <coughs> Whatever our, our motivation for such a lack of pragmatic effect, we are guilty as political animals or as politicians, as leaders. We have to see things done. If not, we were leaders, but we are not still mm -hmm. leaders. So the assumption of power can actually lead to leadership failures. Yeah, but when we, when we think that words are deeds, mm -hmm. that words can provoke the change. They can provoke, but they are not the change as itself. We can't direct the sea. That's uh, that's uh, Vercor saying from Second World War. We can't direct the sea. What what what's what's born? What's what's born in the sea, in the deep sea? All those uh, spontaneous movements. That's not up to us to direct them. But when, I, when they are on the surface and we are on this winning wage, we, we have to stop with the words. We have to produce accomplished facts. Stop. I mean, just from the grassroots activist perspective, I think the words, words are everything. When you're, yeah, when you're doing the deeds, they just have that much more weight. So for us, it's all been... Um, going places, just internally, going places, Tibetans never thought that we could go into the heart of Beijing, to the top of Mount Everest, demonstrating with our actions that, you know, we have power, we don't control everything, and then delivering the message that we need to deliver in exactly, like, from the heart, right way that we can possibly deliver it in that moment. That, for us, is how we built influence that has guided our movement to be a little more strategic from the outside at least. So it's the combination of the words in the right place with the facts.
effect, in, in combination with strategic, effective strategic nonviolent action. But that's from the movement building model. Yeah. And what about being a woman? Are there special advantages and disadvantages? Why you don't ask me? I have a female character. I feel discriminated. All right. I think that women are stronger. There are many biological proofs. My mom is 99. That's mm -hmm. one of the proofs. And my father passed away. So I think that uh, I trust women and I like to work with women, which you can find in 5,000 pages of my police file. That I like to work with women. <laughs> in terms of being one of the leaders of nonviolent struggle. And are there special advantages that a woman can have? So, I have to answer this first. And we have a lot of women in the room. Right, and I, and I have to say, I'm not in Tibet. I'm not facing, you know, the same consequences and the torture and the, the intricate misery we're facing as women in the jails at the hands of all these men on the streets. The, all of those threats are so different. So I can't speak from that perspective, from an organizing perspective in a community that, and basically every meeting we go into, whether it's with the corporations or our own internal community work, or in alliances, it's so often men that you're meeting with and working with. And uh, I think, well, and some people like this, some people don't, but what I try to do, and what I think probably comes from easier to me as being a woman, is speak from the heart. And always go to the human emotional side. And maybe I, my thoughts aren't as organized in that methodical kind of, I don't know what it takes to achieve power, the, the corporate level in our community, whatever it is, it's about, I believe something is there about speaking from the heart, being open and mm -hmm. honest and rooted in myself and not uh, in an idea of what people want, those people across the table, those power brokers want and what they're comfortable with. I don't know. Maybe we should throw that out to the participants, yes? So I want to share, actually, some of my observation with Syrian women. So we interviewed 20 Syrian activists, and actually we, we noticed that two of them were leader, like from their activity, from their description. And when we asked about the challenges, we found that the challenges usually, the society was a challenge beside the security forces. But those women, even though that they talked about the challenges, it seems that they, like, maybe one of them didn't see it at all, it ignore, ignore it, maybe because she was from conservative society. The other one, I think she considered it as a humor. She said, this is, this is one of the jokes that she found. This is one of the challenges that she, she faced some hostility from the community. But you can see it like from their description or from their answer. You can see that they are a leader. In the movement. Yes, Daria? Am I saying it correctly? No, it's the wrong one. Uh, Evan, I'm sorry. Um, Another observation is that speaking of the Middle East, that women power is manipulated for the political title. So when there's a demonstration, all the women are encouraged to come and show up and demonstrate what once that is achieved, okay, no, go back home, you know? And, and it, it's like maneuvering the social space because I don't want to portray a very negative 
image of the Middle East because half of the rhetoric about women oppression in the Middle East is not true. You know, like we have lots of power and we, and we know how to navigate the social space to get what we want. But there is also the other dynamic where in massive political demonstrations and protests there is this, this dynamic of using and abusing women power. Yeah. I have a, an observation as a, like a, as an outsider observing women in the movement in Serbia. And you know it, it, it goes broader. But I think that the, the social movement is not a formal organization. It doesn't have a formal hierarchy. And one of the biggest problems for leaders is you know when they are, uh, how shall I say, their leadership is actually weakened by the formality of their authority. If they have a title, if they have an official position, if they have, and men usually care about these things much more. And even like Malessa, I mean, even fame can actually hinder the leadership. Mm -hmm. These are all things that uh, the, the best leadership is the leadership of the idea, of the initiative, of the of the work, not of the title. And since women are first less care about titles and this kind of formal. Uh, power that, 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 that men here, and second, because they're usually deprived of that, they actually focus more on this real mm -hmm. leadership of initiative, of an idea, of pushing things forwards and all that stuff. And this actually what, what on the surface looks like a weakness because they're not allowed to get that, it actually uh, creates a much bigger strength for leadership. Does that make sense to you, Kevin? Sort of. So I'm going to try to be fair and go in the direct. The first hand I saw was Andreas. Um, yeah, just something that came to my mind uh, about uh, women in social movements. There was also crowd control of these movements in uh, in, Je in Janine in, uh, in the West Bank. There has recently been a new riot police force been introduced by the Palestinian Authority, which actually consists of women, because it's much. <coughs> Uh, because it's to a certain extent difficult in more like in societies where there is a lot of taboo uh, in this regard for men to control uh, women demonstrators without uh, raising concerns or so uh, now a woman riot police force that should be dealing with these issues. Uh, the whole body politics and the symbolism in front of the media. Yes. Um, you know, actually, uh, just because of what Nivit said, is that the problem, uh, I mean, usually also in the Middle East, maybe, is that women actually paved the road for men to I mean, uh, for example, let's take Pakistan as an example. Most of the voters who voted in the elections, they were women. And they even uh, uh, voted, I mean, they gave the chance for men to lead. But after that, there has been call for women to unite in one voice in order to strengthen women presence in different sectors. But they refuse because of their cultural, religious, and political affiliation. So, and this division actually wants them to be uh, uh, less present in the uh, political arena. You see what I mean? So they are like facilitators uh, for women to lead. And uh, unfortunately, their voices became, uh, become always um, not so strong at any. But I mean, and other than that, talking about leadership in general, I, I have, uh, I mean, my personal feeling is that leaders uh, should have two faces, actually. I mean, sometimes some people say that two faces is not good and everyone should be like one real face. But no, I think it should be one merciful face for the people that uh, they like this leader and for his uh, friends and those who would like to strengthen him. And at the same time, uh, he has to be a tough with those who are trying to, uh, I mean, uh, make things worse. I mean, the president we uh, saw recently, I mean, I had a feeling that I'm not, I mean, very familiar, but he was so nice with almost everyone. And that's why uh, this led to uh, quite a uh, quick change. I mean, he just, I mean, they achieved the victory only a few years back. And then they didn't, uh, or he was not able to, to sustain this, maybe because it's not good also to be so kind sometimes. So, um, 
I'm going to have to be giving you 10 minutes, and I, I have to go. We thought this would be over at 3.20, and I actually have something, an appointment at 4 o'clock that I have to keep. So, Kim, we have another session as well, but you're going to take over for me, correct? And um, in, as Mary said, I, I don't think in this situation I truly know so much about leadership. I've studied it for a long time. But usually, I discover that the people I speak to know more about it than I do. So I don't think I matter here. I think Kim can take over beautifully. But I would like to leave with this thought about two faces, about the necessity, perhaps, of at times being very firm, and how one keeps one's ethics as one faces those situations. So if I could throw that question out put Kim in the driver's seat here, and um, I will see you at quarter after six to continue this conversation with me on the cruise. Okay, I know I have to give this all up. All right. um, thank you so much. It was a wonderful conversation. Somebody has to take care of these books because they're the only copy we have in the school of Peter Ackerman's dissertation. I can trust you to Are we going to take Yeah, we'll just take one or two more questions. Actually, um Okay. So Chesla would like to, to make a comment before we open up to more questions. It's a very serious statement, you don't believe me, but that's a very serious statement coming from a very deep, uh, let's say, experience. I observed that, first of all, only 1% of the society wants to engage and to risk. So always fighting for majority, we fight with small, small minority. But within this minority of active people, I observed that handicapped persons are much more courageous than others. That women taking alone, alone, divorce, for instance, or without husband who died, who need to take care of her child, those persons are much more motivated and don't fear so much because something bad happened in their life. That's not only the fact known from the history that minorities, ethnic minorities, are much much, much, more, much more engaged in many opposition movements. But here that's that there are members of the same society and I felt how much someone who, who is not so happy as a regular family, as regular lucky people, is, feels a certain compassion and a certain dedication to the cause, much bigger. It was my observation. I had a classmate who was one of the, of the hardest cases after polio. He was without legs, and, and arms, practically. He finished his law studies from a very poor uh, family, and he was extremely active from the late 70s in the opposition and after in the Solidarity Underground. And he was a real fighter. So sometimes, of course, he was aware what could happen to him when he could be arrested. Nevertheless, he was much more catered to the people with homes, cars, large families, and having support of their own private circle. So I, we have to, to admit it. And because I am joking, it was very serious thing. Okay. I saw a hand up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I wanted to share our experience in Kenya about the involvement of women in struggle. And in the 80s, a lot of uh, people went to prison. Very many of them. And uh, there was uh, the politicians who were busy fighting for power and so on. And there is this small group of women who came to a section in the road called Freedom Corner. And they said they are not really that place until our sons are released. 
And one time when the president was passing through the place, they were so annoyed that they stripped. And it was a scandal all over the world. But uh, after a short while, about four or five months, all the political prisoners were released. And in Kenya, if you talk of women, you don't talk of freedom corner, you're not talking about women. Mm -hmm. if, you are not, if you are talking of political prisoners, you talk about freedom corner, you talk of women. One of those, one of the leaders of those women, uh, is Wangari Malai, who was later on given the Nobel Prize for this. So it's very, very significant in Kenya when you talk of struggle. That is actually um, historical. Geographical and historical, I think it's historical. Uh, the other example I want to talk about women and struggle also is around the same time, things were so difficult, many people went to prison and so on. So there is this lady who used to assist the relatives of political prisoners. Very active, she used to write letters, she used to get money to support those who are going to prison. She was not arrested. Uh, later on, some people started saying maybe she was a spy. But my understanding is that the system was very careful what to do with this woman. Because if you arrest her, then it becomes a big issue. You know, arresting a woman and putting that woman in prison. Uh, so there was an understanding of some sort that you don't arrest this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to share one of the interesting stories how it's so really in uh, civil resistance in 1998. It was just actually clarified the previous presentation about something politics. To me, personally, it's very political. So in the case of, uh, in 1998, for example, it was a, a crisis, economic crisis. Then the, the price of milk was so high. And the woman starting to go, oh, we cannot survive with this. We have to move up. And then, then, at the same time, there was happening in the students who, uh, on the street. That is from something personal and then connecting with something politics. Do you know what the women uh, did at that time? They gathering all the support and they feeding the, child, uh, the, the students who actually joined the student resistance at that time. It's almost more than two months. That's the woman coming and then, and then got the food and then dress, anything that they, they, they would like to, to support this. But unfortunately, sometimes this kind of rule is not considered as sexy rule because it's kind of gender rule. Because women very concerned and something that really think with the life. But in the politics, it's always forgotten this kind of rule. People always concern on something very masculine called politics party, whatever they call it. But something very personal that actually supporting uh, the achievement that should be also considered. I think this talking about the women rules in the civil rights system, we need to be very, very uh, specific in terms of looking at not to go into the big definition on what is civil resistance and, and, and so-called politics, something like that. So, so let's go back to the personal is also political. From your experience? And then, so. Okay. Um, um, I actually want to be uh, a little critical, to be honest, I'm a bit critical, to the whole idea. Uh, um, you know, for me, this session is about leadership, and leadership means uh, being able to make decisions. What we, are, what we have been discussing, in my opinion, is the role of women in uh, civil resistance, not leadership. Are these women the activists in Syria? Thank you very and much. All of these women, are they actually making decisions? <laughs> and this is very critical, and, and I will explain why. Because, uh, you know, um, the, you will find women everywhere. But uh, in my opinion, uh, putting women in, in, in different roles is different than making them able, able or empower them to make decisions, actual decisions in any movement, and, and actually leadership and, and transition and whatever. And we, were, someone discussed about the Middle East, and, and, and it's, uh, some, it's uh, I'm from the Middle East, it frustrates me when, when people basically discuss 
the women issues or the women leadership, especially now after the Arab Spring, uh, in the Middle East, as if this is just exceptional in the Middle East. <laughs> because this is a worldwide issue. Where did you, did you find, I mean, just, I, I, I feel we should expand the idea. Where did we find a, a woman leader? of a civil rights movement people actually tend to believe them. So they would be great leaders, normally, for any movement. When a woman, when the woman in Kenya went, because women resemble mother, women resemble respect in most of the societies in the world. They resemble something that people really can identify with. They can gather around. But they will never be the center point. And this may be the, I'm just taking the discussion a little bit further, because this is what we are discussing at. I think it's important. Are you responding to this point? I think this is an important point because we've sort of shifted the conversation. And um, it really was originally about leadership. And now we're being challenged, which is well, is it about, if we're talking about the role of women, aren't women, for their own self leadership, shouldn't they be able to make decisions? And where are they in these movements? And everybody's talking about how important they are, but really, are they in the titular leadership position that might give them the decisions that are conferred upon men? So that's what I'm. Hearing.